Chapter 3 Pirates, Freaks and Baby Steps Towards a Revolution 3.1 Marcus Bella is freed from the mighty pirate Morgan Henry Marcus Bella, the chief scientist of ISS led by Bjorn Muller, woke up from slumber. He was studying himself through the mirror in the prison cell of Morgan Henry's pirate spaceship. He watched the blue-reddish marks around his eyes where the scuba mask had pressured his eyelids and all around his eyes. And he couldn't believe how fortunate he had been. To survive with a mere scuba gear and a tiny emergency pot in deep outer space for long enough to be taken hostage by a pirate ship? It was scientifically impossible and yet here he was. Marcus made a promise to himself that if he came out of this incident alive, he would change his sexual fetishes from scuba gear to space gear. As space gear was clearly more useful for someone who spent his life working on a spaceship. He shrugged off his fantasies of ocean diving on Earth. The door to Marcus Bell's cell opened and in came Captain Morgan Henry wearing luxurious pirate clothes with a leather eye patch made from buffalo skin, a wooden peg leg and beautiful red and blue winged parrot on his shoulder. Captain Morgan Henry aimed his flintlock pistol to the head of Marcus Bauer who was rubbing his eyes in disbelief. Morgan Henry said, Arr! Got something stuck in your eye, eh? Marcus Bell said, I must be dead, right? I end up in the outer space with the scuba gear and when I wake up, I face a 17th century pirate. Morgan Henry said, Nay, you are alive and it's the year 2872. Marcus Bell said, but what's with the outfit, the eye patch, the peg leg, the gun and the parrot? Morgan Henry said, this outfit is my fashion statement. I'm using a wooden peg leg because I lost a leg during a raid at the interstellar galaxy. The parrot is my beloved pet and this pistol is just for show. Marcus Bell said, but why don't you use stem cell technology to grow yourself a leg and an eye? Morgan Henry said, you're right. I never thought about that. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Good news for you. Someone paid your ransom. A hefty price to keep you alive. Pervert. Marcus Bell said, why do you call me a pervert? Morgan Henry said, We found you wearing scuba gear in deep space. That must be a strange fetish. Anyways, come with me to the loading dock. You are to meet a friend. Morgan and Marcus walked towards the loading dock where Marcus was reunited with an old friend, Dr. Chi Chen Cheng, Marcus's boss on the science commission an occasional secret fuck buddy. Morgan Henry left and Shi Chen walked up to Marcus and slapped him. Marcus looked at him dumbfounded and spoke. Wait a sec, you make your way here to pay my ransom and rescue me and the first thing you do is to slap me? What am I missing? Dr. Chi Chen Cheng said, I told you not to watch gay porn from dodgy Russian websites in the science 
B. Now we lost the science bay on Bjorn Muller's flagship. How are we going to spy on him now? Marcus said, I didn't watch Russian gay porn. It just popped up suddenly. I think Bjorn Muller caused it to happen to silence me and get rid of the evidence that Kayla is still alive. Chi Chen said, Okay, then I'm not angry at you anymore. Yes, Kayla's supposed to death. What a joke. It takes more to fool us at House Cheng than closing her social media accounts and delivering a bucket of blood and body pieces, especially since we have hacked the camera on her space phone, tracking her every move. The mighty House Cheng is far more superior than the House Muller faction. Marcus said, Oh, really? Are you not going to publish this information? Shi Chen said, We are. But first, we are going to watch Bjorn hang himself with his lies. Then we announce that Kayla is alive to humiliate him as much as possible. Marcus said, Good. I want him to suffer for trying to kill me. You saved me. Is there anything I can do for you, Chi Chen? Chi Chen said, Yes, I want you to speak to Admiral Max Wellington. I want you to tell him about Bjorn's attempt on your life, and then request a transfer to the Proxima Thule research station. If you are granted access to this station, See if you can convince Kayla Eisenstein to attack the station. Marcus said, Ha 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 ha, you shifty Chinese bottom. That's an incredibly far-fetched scenario. But I still love you. Xu Chen said, Oh yes, my big German bear. And yet you know it, it will happen just like I said. Hee <laughs> hee! Marcus said, Yes, you are certainly a cunning man. Me likey. Shi Chen said, Indeed. Now come with me to my private shuttle. It is a one week flight back to Earth. And we have plenty of catching up to do. After saying this, Chi Chen winked at Marcus and they both boarded the Chi Chen's shuttle, doing a lot of catching up. Chapter 3.2 Bjorn Muller is having a pretty terrible holiday. Bjorn Muller was trying to enjoy the alcoholic drink and the sunset on the exclusive luxurious tropical resort where he was spending his holiday at. It turned out to be a difficult task. Outside the resort, a large crowd had shouted obscenities towards him for days on end. Inside the resort, the guards gave him hostile looks. The waitstaff kept spilling drinks on him, and chefs kept serving him undercooked and off food. So why were people giving poor old Bjorn such a hard time? Had the people of Earth finally had enough of his and his family's tyrannical rule over the planet and the solar system? No, the answer was simple, more simple than that. Bjorn was accused to be the cause of the cancellation of the Bronze Age fools. The learning point for Bjorn was that one could oppress poor people on the other planets, such as Mars, and Earthlings would not bet an eye. But to cause their favorite TV show to be cancelled, and Hell will break loose! Bjorn was considering going back to Harnstadt, where he could spend the rest of his holiday comfortably in his suite in European Towers, far away from protesters, poor people and other rebels. 
But then he realized something. His father, Joachim Muller, also lived in European Tower. So if Bjorn went back home, his father might resume his attempt at convincing Bjorn to get married to the horrible freak, Alicia White, the daughter of House White's leader. Bjorn shivered at the thought and realized something, that sometimes being at work was preferable to being on a holiday. With his work ethics suddenly reinvigorated, Bjorn decided to get on a shuttle and hurry back to the Terran Council base on Moon Phobos, where he was stationed. At least no one dared to argue with him over there. Chapter 3.3 Brahma decides to go for a long walk. A very, very, very long walk. In the Divine Dimension, Brahma, one of the Zetan Divine Space Gods, decided that it was time to pay his crazy ex, Rangda, a visit. The reason was that he had lost his divine connection to Kayla when she, for no apparent reason, killed her lover, Jeshua. While this unjustified murder could be because of the simple reason that Kayla was a psychotic madwoman who had DNA of an alien species, Brahma was convinced that it was because his insane ex-girlfriend, Rangda, had managed to escape her eternal prison and connect to Kayla telepathically without Brahma detecting it. When Brahma had raised his concern with his boss Zeus, Zeus had been positive to sending Brahma on his way to check if Rangda was still in that prison cell. But when Brahma had asked to borrow Zeus's spaceship, it had been a negative answer. When Brahma complained about the long walk to get there, Zeus had said, 300,000 kilometers is certainly a long walk. So you better get started. Chop, chop. Thus Brahma concluded that his boss didn't mind breaking his legs by sending him off on an outrageously long walking journey. And he told himself that Zeus wouldn't get his vote for the Zetan Boss of the Year award on the following year. But how would he find his way to Rangda's prison? There were no GPS signals in the Divine Dimension and compasses didn't work either. Fortunately, there was another way. As the Divine Dimension was an endless flat plane, roughly as a flat earth conspiracist pictured how earth would look, things never fell behind the horizon. Thus, Rangda's eternal prison would be visible from his location, albeit extremely tiny. Since Brahma was an advanced alien species, he obviously had very good binoculars at his disposal. Brahma walked up on the top of his house where he would have a free sightline towards the horizon. He then very slowly turned studying the horizon in a circular pattern. After turning 359 degrees, he finally saw Rangda's prison in the far horizon and it was a discovery that gave him mixed feelings. On the one hand, it was a relief that he finally saw it after looking for three days straight. On the other hand, if he had only turned one degree to the left from his original position, instead of 359 degrees to the right, he would have saved himself a lot of work. Having spotted Rangda's prison, he started his long walk. On the bedside, the walk would take years and he would be constantly hungry and thirsty. On the flip side, neither hunger nor thirst 
could kill him because he was a semi divine alien space god. Stuck in the author's analogy for what we know as the seventh heaven, the divine dimension. Chapter 3.4 No rest for the wicked one, also known as Bjorn Muller. Bjorn Muller was back in his spacious and luxurious office at the Terran Council Phobos base. Never had he imagined that he would enjoy his return to work, but the first hour had been pretty quiet and peaceful. The learning point for the average worker reading this is that if your holiday entails having an angry mob threatening to lynch you outside of your resort, the security guards giving you hostile looks, the waiters keep spilling drinks on you, and the chefs keep giving you expired food, then you're better off back to work. Bjorn sat back in his couch and poured himself an expensive glass of scotch. How relaxing it was to be back at work. The quiet and peace ended abruptly though when Bjorn's boss Admiral Max Wellington called him and requested to see him immediately. Which reminded Bjorn about the annoying fact that although he was the son of the Terran Council leader, he wasn't even the boss of his own military base. Begrudgingly, Bjorn made his way to his boss's office to see what was on Max's mind. Bjorn Muller said, you wished to see me, Admiral Max Wellington? Max Wellington said, I have received some grave accusations against you, Rear Admiral Muller. Bjorn Muller said, The trash bin is over there, so why don't you throw what you have just said to it? You know who my father is, so why even bother accusing me of things? Max Wellington said, I also know that I'm the highest ranked officer on this base, despite your father's position. Bjorn Muller said, Oh, Maxi Jealousy. Who has the biggest office with the best selection of expensive drinks and women? Burn in it, Max Wellington said. Um, not meant as a burn. I'm just explaining your childish behavior why you are here. Besides, I don't drink and I'm loyal to my wife, Magda. Bjorn Muller said, Wasn't she and your daughter killed by space pirates last year? Ha 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 ha. Max Wellington said, You're an asshole, Bjorn. Anyways, I'm here because I had some grave accusations come in against you. Bjorn said, I told you already, the bin is over there. My father doesn't care about Martian winding. Max Wellington said, Well, I think he will care about this. I spoke with Marcus Bauer the other day. He accused you of intentionally sabotaging the science bay to kill him and get rid of the fake evidence of Kayla Eisenstein's death. Bjorn said, that's ridiculous. The dislodgement of the science bay was due to the Russian porn virus that Marcus Bauer downloaded. Max Wellington said, how do you know the accident was caused by a Russian porn virus since you never went back to investigate the science bay. Bjorn Muller said, I know because I had to reprimand Marcus Bell earlier for downloading prohibited X-rated video clips and for storing a scuba gear in the science bay. Max Wellington said, a scuba gear on a spaceship? Why? Bjorn said, you don't want to know. Max said, probably a correct statement. 
Björn Müller said, anyways, how does Marcus Bear claim to have survived the accident? Max Wellington said, well, he claims that he equipped the scuba gear and then was picked up, resuscitated and taken hostage by the infamous space pirate Captain Morgan Henry. Apparently, Shi Chen Cheng showed up as well a couple of weeks later and paid his ransom. Bill Muller said, That's an absurd and far-fetched story. A divine intervention would make more sense. Anyways, Shi Chen and Marcus have a secret sodomite relationship. Shi Chen probably told him to tell lies about me to make my life miserable. Max Wellington said, How can you possibly know about Shi Chen and Marcus Bao's relationship? Bjorn said, Well, <laughs> they invited me to a threesome once. I was considering it to piss off my father. But then I realized that my brother Benjamin is already doing that. So I dropped that idea. Max Wellington said, you do realize that your brother Benjamin really is homosexual and not just pretending to piss your dad off. Bjorn said, that's ridiculous. Us, the Mullers, have perfect DNA. How could we be gay? Besides, I have suffered from unrequited love to that bitch Kayla Eisenstein for the last four years. How would that happen if I preferred men? Max Wellington said, What are you talking about, you idiot? Did you just confess treason? Just to disprove that you're gay? Bjorn Muller said, Did I? What a shame. I hacked the security in this room and turned off the cameras and the audio recordings. Max Wellington said, Fuck this shit. I'm sending you back to your father. Joachim Muller can deal with you. Get the hell out of my office. Bjorn Muller said, that's all right. I'll think about you and laugh every now and then when I enjoy my life in luxury and abundance on earth. After this, Bjorn left the room with an arrogant smile, blissfully unaware that his father was not planning a royal welcoming reception for him when he made his way back to Earth. Chapter 3.5 Kayla Eisenstein conveniently finds very useful and advanced alien technology. Kayla was having a moment of self-doubt. She was particularly doing a Charlie Sheen, questioning whether she was actually still winning, despite everything that had happened. She had gone from a famous revolutionist with a large army to the god queen of a bunch of inbred peasants. Living such an anachronistic lifestyle that even the Amish seemed progressive and modern. But Kayla concluded her visions had told her that she would win, and since she definitely was not crazy, this must mean that she would actually start winning the war soon. But how could this possibly happen? She was dead and had a bunch of Bronze Age peasants worshipping her. Bjorn and her enemies in the Terran Council, on the other hand, had a huge army and advanced weaponry. What kind of idiot would come out backing her now? But then Kayla realized something, that there must be magical, undiscovered alien technologies in the divine dimension. That was all she needed to turn the war against the Terran Council to her advantage. She had remembered the day when she was hooked to the divine machine and saw the dead Yahweh. She knew there were more secrets to look for in that divine dimension. She turned towards the naked and hung over Metatron, who was in her bed. 
Kayla said. Wake up, Metatron. We have things to do. We need to go to the Divine Dimension and find godlike technologies that we can use against our enemies in the Terran Council. Metatron said, That's a terrible idea. Let's bring in some more Edenite wine and resume our sex marathon. Kayla said, Metatron, we have spent three days straight drinking wine and having sex. Don't you want to do something else for once? Metatron said, I spent 62 years here without wine and without sex. I have a lot of catching up to do. Kayla said, Thanks for reminding me how old you are. Metatron said, Just one more day, please. Today is Saturday. It is illegal to work in our culture. Kayla said, Wait a second, you said the same thing yesterday? Metatron said, I was lying yesterday. Kayla said, and lying is not a sin in your culture? Metatron said, well, not when it is for a good cause. Kayla said, that's enough. You come with me to the divine dimension and find some advanced godlike alien technologies or I will close down your window of opportunity for sex. Metatron said, you drive a tough bargain. Let's go. Kayla and Metatron teleported their minds through the divine dimension and entered the Zetan archives in the divine palace. As Kayla had expected, there seemed to be blueprints for thousands of advanced Zetan technologies there. There was only one slight problem. All the descriptions to the technologies were written in the Zetan language. Unfortunately, neither Metatron nor Kayla had any idea how to read the Zetan language, even if it had been very convenient for the plot. Kayla sighed. She was so close to godlike Zetan technologies and yet so far from getting what she needs. Metatron said, Seems that we have run into a dead end. Kayla said, You tell me about it. Why did the Zetans, supposedly the most advanced alien species ever, who then become our worshipped gods, have to write in this gibberish language instead of writing in normal 29th century English like the rest of us? Metatron said, good question, but presumably they didn't know about the English language, considering that English language appeared in the 5th century AD and the Zetan civilization was destroyed in the multi-millennial war long before that. Kayla said, wait, how can you possibly know these things since you can't read the Zetan language? Metatron said, Abraham told me. Kayla said, sorry, but your former dementia ridden psychopathic boss does not seem like the most credible source of information. Metatron said, true, now I remember. I used the AI and a code breaking program to decipher the Zetan language. It made about as much sense as a SpaceNet auto translate function mode, which isn't very good at detecting the right meaning at all. But you'll get the rough idea at the very least. Kayla said, cool, let's try it on this schematic. Potato's skin will cry and fade away when sharp blades end its life. That sounds like a cool weapon. Metatron said, Hmm, that sounds like Zetan technology for a potato peeler. Kayla said, Damn it, let's keep looking. Metatron and Kayla kept looking. After sifting through useless and plot irrelevant technologies for days on end, they finally found five schematics that were crucial for the progress of the story. These were 1. 
the Zetan spherical communication blocker, alien technology that seemingly stopped the enemy's telepathic communications on demand, two, the Zetan advanced cloaking device, alien technology that made spaceships virtually invisible, three, the Zetan ballistic energy absorber, unexplainable technology that stopped bullets midair, matrix style. Four, the Zetan unprotected bionic chip disruptor, a foolproof technology that blocked the enemy's bionic microchips, causing them to freeze and look like drooling fools. Five, the Zetan external DNA modifier, convenient trinket that changed the appearance and the outer DNA layer of a person. Essentially everything including their sense of smell to that of another person. They also found a lot of other technologies that they used to enhance their sex life. But that's outside of the scope of this story. 3.6 Marcus Bell decides to betray House Muller and his fellow scientists. Marcus Bell was sitting by his desk at the Proxima Thule research station located in the asteroid belt. He was sick of his new job already. As bad as it had been working under Bjorn Muller, especially when Bjorn had tried to kill him, working at Proxima Thule was even worse. Proxima Thule was the House Muller's research station for completely useless researchers. It was the place where utterly incompetent scientists and guards were sent to work, so they wouldn't hamper the progress or cause damages elsewhere. Thus, Marcus Bell had to work with a bunch of scientists that had received too many accidental electric shocks during their crazy experiments. And they were protected by a bunch of perpetually drunk and severely obese security guards. The current project they were working on was not any better and Marcus Bell had been tasked with improving the design for the helium inflated goat sex doll. What an utterly derogatory task for a prominent scientist like himself. The breaking point for Marcus Bell was when one of the perpetually drunk guards had vomited all over him and the goat sex doll design he was working on was completely destroyed. Marcus had enough and he would follow the wishes of his shifty and unreliable on and off lover, Shi Chen Cheng, and betray the Terran Council and House Muller by contacting the infamous terrorist Kayla Eisenstein and urge her to attack Proxima Thule. But how would he reach Eden with his message undetected? Marcus decided for an ingenious plan. To call the Edenites from the Proxima Thu 24 hours call center, pretending to his colleagues that he was making a sales call. After a few signals, Metatron picked up the phone on the other side. Metatron said, We are not buying any fucking goat sex dolls. Fuck off. After that, Metatron hung up. Realizing that his cover as a salesman wouldn't work, Marcus decided to go for the risky option to call again. This time with his own miniature hologram generator or a futuristic cell phone. Metatron said, You again? What do you want? Marcus Bear said, I'm the chief scientist. Marcus Bauer, I'm calling from Proxima Thule Base. Can I speak to Kayla Eisenstein, please? Metatron said, Kayla is dead, and why would a chief scientist call people trying to sell sex dolls? Marcus Bauer said, The sex doll sale was just a cover. 
What I really want to do is to betray the Terran Council and get you to attack this small and very weakly defended research facility. Meta Tran said, And why would you want to betray the Terran Council? Marcus said, Because Bjorn Muller tried to kill me to cover up the fact that Kayla never died. I know she's alive. Ha Cheng hacked her phone so they have a live update of what? what she's up to. Metatron said, Those are good selling points. But tell me, what use do we have for Proximal Thule? Marcus Bell said, The station is full of prominent Terran scientists that can help you transform your backward Eden Bronze Age tribe to a futuristic metropolis. Metatron said, considering the useless inventions that has been released from your facility in the past, employing those scientists would bring us even further backwards, from the Bronze Age to the Stone Age. Anyways, I'll talk to you later, Marcus. I got to see what the boss has to say. After this, Metatron hung up the phone and Marcus Bell had no choice but to bide his time and keep working on his fulfilling research project. 3.7 Kayla sets fire to an amphora with olive oil and orders an attack. After the phone call with Marcus Bell, Metatron went to Eden looking for Kayla. He found her sitting on the throne in an empty ancient temple studying a burning amphora with olive oil. Metatron said, Why that long face? And why are you burning olive oil? Kayla said, The bloody Edenites, they came with offerings today and they brought me this. I ask them for high-powered weapons, and they bring me olive oil. To punish them, I set fire to the olive oil to show my dissatisfaction. They called me a crazy bitch and took off. Sob, sob. <laughs> Metatron said, have you heard about free trade? Maybe you'd have a better outcome if you sold the olive oil outside of Eden and bought the weapons out of the sales. Kayla said, perhaps, I'll try that next time. Metatron said, good. I had a call from Marcus Bell, by the way. Apparently, he knows that you are alive since House Cheng's Shi Chen Cheng hacked your phone. He threatens to tell Bjorn and exposing your house Muller that you are alive, unless you agree to attack the Proxima Thule research station. Kayla said, that's awesome. I have been waiting for a sign to attack the Eteran Council for a long time. This is it. Metatron said, fair enough, but what purpose would an attack on Proxima Thule have? Kayla said, many. I will kidnap the prominent scientists, steal their valuable research data, and sow fear in House Muller with my mysterious random attack. Metatron said, All right, cool. I'll let Marcus know we are going tomorrow and that we will see him in a couple of days. Kayla said, Are you a bloody idiot? You're going to tell a prominent Terran Council scientist that we are planning to attack his base? Of course not. You stay here while I bring my Edenite militia to attack the outpost. Metatron said, Your Edenite militia? They haven't been trained in modern combat yet, you know. They still think it's the Bronze Age and that a tribal war formation with spears and shields is the way to go. Kayla said, Meh, they'll learn as they go. Prepare my spaceship, Metatron. It's time for Kayla Eisenstein to fight again. Chapter 3.8 The attack on Proxima Thule turns out to be hard work. 
A few days later, Kayla and her Edenite militia approached the Proxima Thule research station. With their Zetan stealth technology, there was no problem approaching the base undetected. But Kayla did have another problem on her hand, that her Edenite militia insisted that a Bronze Age phalanx was the best way to fight. Oh fuck it, Kayla thought to herself. With her Zetan alien technologies, she could probably take on the few incompetent guards herself. Meanwhile, Captain Bernd Messerschmidt woke up from his nap when the warning indicator blinked numerously in his security office. He looked at the computer screen in disbelief, turned his eyes to the half-empty whiskey bottle and then looked at the screen again. What he saw was beyond disbelief. The infamous and supposedly dead terrorist Kayla Eisenstein had docked with his station and she was accompanied by a group of men wearing bronze spears and bronze shields. Men that looked like they were so ancient. He turned to his colleague Sebastian Marika to confirm the vision. Brent Messerschmidt said, Hey Marika, do you also see the terrorist Kayla Eisenstein accompanied by a group of Bronze Age warriors on the monitor? Sebastian Marika said, Mas ayahuasca por favor. Bernd Messerschmidt said, Why on earth are you asking for tequila instead of answering my question? Sebastian Marika said, I see them, yes. But it's so absurd, so it must be delirious, a delirious hallucination. Thus, I need to smoke some ayahuasca and drink tequila to keep my sanity going. Brent Messersmith said, this is so absurd. Call HQ to find out if they're using the station for a movie production today. Aren't this cruise from the reality show that was cancelled? The Bronze Age Fools? Sebastian Marika said, Sorry sir, but it seems like all our communications are down. As if we are blocked by an unknown alien technology. Everything says blocked. Bernd Messerschmidt said, Or maybe you just spilled a bottle of booze in the relay again? Get the other guards! Let's confront these clowns. Sebastian Marika said, Sorry, Bernd. It's just you and I guarding all of the station. The rest went on holiday two weeks ago. Bernd Messerschmidt said, What? Why didn't anyone say goodbye? Sebastian Marika said, They did, but you were too drunk to remember. Bernd Messerschmidt said, Bloody hell. Oh well, time for you and I to stop this infamous terrorist and her Bronze Age Fool's followers. Meanwhile, Kayla armed to her teeth and equipped with advanced alien technology, she saw the only two blind drunk and severely obese security guards walking towards her. Was this all the guards for this Terran Council facility that is filled with expensive machineries and top-end technology? What a lucky day! She was lifting her rifle and about to shoot them when she got one of her visions. Rangda, hissing, Dance and they will die! Kayla shocked in disbelief. She said, Wait, who are you? And why would dancing be a better option than just shooting the guards? Rangda screeches, said, <laughs> I am Rangda, Bramble's mistress and your guardian angel. <laughs> Just obey the vision like you always do. Kayla said, Cool, yeah, why not? Following the conversation with Rangda, Kayla decided that the only sensible thing to do was to drop her weapons and start dancing instead. 
The drunken security guards tried to shoot her, but their aim were off by a mile and instead the Edenites had to take cover from stray bullets behind their large bronze shields. Watching Kayla's seductive dance was too much for Sebastian, who had been stuck on a man-only research facility for too long. He got a massive heart attack, clutched his chest with one arm, and accidentally shot burned Mr. Schmidt in the head with his pistol and falling towards the floor. Both men died on the spot. Melchior Dorovich, Kayla's Edenite commander, approached her after the skirmish with an angry expression. Mistress Kayla, why on earth did you start dancing, risking our lives, when all you needed to do was to shoot them with your pistol? Kayla said, why didn't you shoot them with your gun then? Oh yeah, now I remember. You think a bronze spear and a bronze shield is better than a gun? Melchior said, thank you for the lesson, Mistress Kayla. We will start using guns like the rest of humanity. Kayla said, Good, I hope you brought your gas masks because I will open this canister with sleep inducing gas to knock everyone on Proxima Thule unconscious. Without waiting for Melchior's reply, Kayla opened the canister that spread across the space station, knocking everyone including her own Bronze Age militia, which obviously were not wearing gas masks themselves, unconscious. So Kayla, being the only one who had a gas mask on, had to spend the next 10 hours dragging the unconscious scientists as well as her own militia men back to her space shuttle. Being a rebel leader is hard work. Especially if you're an idiot. Sigh. Chapter 3.9 Bjorn Muller reacts to the proximal fuel attack. A few days later, Bjorn Muller was at the Terran Council base on Phobos and was having a bender together with the courtesans Intisa and Kinet. Bjorn enjoyed the company of Intisa and Kinet as he was an immoral villain who was secretly in love with his supposedly dead nemesis, Kayla Eisenstein. As he could not have Kayla, Bjorn did what any wealthy villain would do. He hired escorts that looked like her. This had angered his very racist father, Joachim Muller, who had no real objections to Bjorn's rampant drug and sex abuse but was very upset that Bjorn had fired his North European looking escorts and replaced them with Mediterranean looking ones. Bjorn's bender came to a halt when Admiral Max Wellington knocked on his door. Bjorn opened the door and Max Wellington gave him a surprised and angry look. Max said, why are you still here? Didn't I tell you to go back to Earth and work for your father a month ago, before I went on my holiday? Bjorn said, smiled arrogantly and said, you did. But then my latest shipment of courtesans arrived. My father doesn't allow me to have sex with other races at European Tower. So I decided to stay here and get it out of my system. Max said, that was one month ago. Why are you still here? Bjorn said, you clearly don't have the same appetite that I do. Max said, ugh, you disgust me. Besides, if you stayed on the base during my holiday, why haven't you done anything about the attack on the Proxima Seal research station? Bjorn said, I was considering it, but then I realized I didn't know who the attackers were, so I couldn't reward them. Max said, reward them? Bjorn said, yes, reward them. 
Proxima Thule was the dumping ground for highly paid and utterly useless scientists performing pointless researches. I have wanted to fire them for years, but I don't want to pay them severance packages. So I left the station guarded by only two incompetent security guards, hoping for it to be attacked. And it finally was. After two long years. Max said, okay, so you're not concerned about what your corporal burnt message said? That the base was attacked by Kayla Eisenstein and a bunch of people wearing Bronze Age weapons? Bjorn said, who cares about that? Besides, his claims are so absurd so that I can only assume they are bullshit. Max said, very well, if you don't intend to work while at this base, then please get the fuck out. Bjorn said, sure, but can you lend me a couple of thousand Terran credits in cash? I ran out of cash and I haven't tipped my friends for their excellent service yet. Max said, hell no, get the fuck out of here before I call the guards. After hearing this, Bjorn finally gave in returning to Earth for a long overdue catch-up with his father. Chapter 3.10 Not exactly a royal reception A few days later, Bjorn Muller arrived back into his home city on Earth, Harnstad. To his great disappointment, he did not receive a royal welcoming reception upon returning home. Instead, he got detained in immigration as he was carrying an outdated biometric passport in his hand. After a few hours, Bjorn was released and his next disappointment came when he couldn't book a driverless cab to European Towers, as he had neglected to renew his credit card. How could this happen to the son of the mightiest person on earth? the son of Terran Council Chairman, Joachim Muller. After walking for three painstaking hours to get to European Tower, Bjorn found the answer. It had all been orchestrated by his father. Upon seeing Bjorn, Joachim Muller smirked at him and spoke. Welcome back, Bjorn. I hope getting here wasn't too difficult. Bjorn Muller said, I would like to report the immigration officers. The idiots didn't recognize me and instead detained me for hours. Joachim Muller said, Yeah, so I heard. Apparently, you were traveling with an expired passport and they did their job. I will commend them for their duty. Bjorn said, but I'm a famous person, they should know about me. Joachim said, you should always carry a valid passport. Any more questions? Bill said, all the cabs refused to drive me today, so I had to walk all the way from the spaceport to here. <laughs> Joachim Muller said, yes, we have had too many freeloaders not paying for transport. So I ordered all drivers to require prepayment for trips made today. Bjorn Muller said, Why do I get the feeling that you are the one behind all the trouble I have had today? Joachim Muller said, Because I am the one causing you all the trouble. You have to stop thinking so highly of yourself. You are the black sheep of the family, and now I have to deal with you as Max Wellington had had enough of your idiocies. Bjorn Muller said, What idiocies? I'm a capable member of this family. Joachim Muller said, Capable member of the family? The last six months you have caused the most popular TV show in the solar system to close down incorrectly announced the death of the most wanted criminal of the solar system when she is still alive. 
managed to get kicked out of a resort and spent more time whoring and boozing than doing actual work. It would be difficult for anyone to be less competent than you. You are even incapable of trivial tasks such as renewing your passport and credit card and then you complain about it. Bjorn Muller said, Bah! Kayla is dead. Some idiotic guard who is revived after being shot in the head proves nothing. Joachim said, That might be true. If it wasn't that the proof of her death that you presented was even less credible. A closed down social media account and a bucket of blood with traces of her DNA. What a pile of dung. Bjorn said, So what is your plan for me then, father? And who are we having dinner with, by the way? Joachim Muller said, Wow, you're finally paying some attention to detail. Yes, there are three table settings on my table and we do have an honored guest joining us. Your new boss. But first, let's drink some wine and enjoy the sunset in silence. Bjorn said, But who? Uh... Joachim Muller got up and slapped Bjorn and said, I said, let's enjoy the sunset in silence. After that, Bjorn shut up and together they shared an utterly unenjoyable hour. Before the guest of honor, Alicia White arrived. Alicia White was the daughter of John White, who was the faction leader of House White. She was the most ridiculous villain of this story in the way that she was both incredible and utterly powerful at the same time. Being the result of genetic manipulation, Alicia was a human infused with the genome of other predator species to give her superior animal-like senses. She had the ferociousness of a tiger and a pair of sharp retractable claws. She had the cool-headedness of a crocodile and the aggressiveness of a raging bull. On top of that, she had the sense of smell of a dog sniffer bloodhound. While these abilities sounded impressive, it had the drawback that she also shared physical features of the animals mentioned. With glowing yellow bright eyes, menacing fangs, lizard-like scaly skin and a small lump of a tail that resembles that of a croc. Her animalistic behavior also made her completely disregard social standards for human-to-human -human interaction. Her father, John, loved her, but realizing that she was a freak, he had chosen to hide her away in the Black Operations Department of House White where she could do what she did best, killing and torturing other humans. Bjorn Muller said, What the fuck is this freak Alicia White doing here? Alicia said nothing and instead she screeched and gripped Bjorn roughly by the balls and licked him in the face before speaking with a hiss. Psst. Your father asked me to come here and put you in place. You have been a naughty boy, Bjorn. I want to taste you from head to toe. Psst. Joachim studied Bjorn, who was in immense pain and couldn't say a word. Eventually he spoke. He said, Impressive move, Alicia. You did what no one else can do. You managed to get the spoiled brat to shut up. You can release him now though. I think he's almost suffocated. Alicia released Bjorn who was gasping for air. And then she took a seat next to Joachim at the table. Bjorn, having regained his breath, shouted at his dad. Ah! 
I'm not marrying that freak. I refused it four years ago and I'll refuse it again. Alicia White said, Psst. Oh, don't worry. I'm not on the marriage market anymore. I have found my calling in life. Bjorn said, And that is? Alicia said, <laughs> To eat naughty boys. Bjorn said, um, you mean like figuratively speaking? Alicia said, No, I meant literally. I kill and eat people that are on the housewife kill list. Yummy. Bjorn said, Stuff that! Joachim said, Well, you have been naughty, Bjorn, so make sure you don't end up on Alicia's naughty list. For your own sake. Fortunately, I'm giving you a chance to redeem yourself. Go with Alicia White and her men to Eden and find out Kayla's whereabouts. Then go to Proxima Thiel to investigate the attack there. If you're successful, I might give you another job when you get back. Bjorn Muller said, Hey, wait! I'm your son and an excellent leader of men. I don't mind investigating the rumors of Kayla's survival, but don't put me under the command of that freak. Joachim Muller said, You were chasing Kayla for four years, but yet you stopped the chase because she closed down her social media profile and delivered you a bucket of blood and gore. Alicia, on the other hand, doesn't stop until she personally has ensured that the target is eliminated. Bjorn Muller said, But she is a monster. She killed most of the population in the Martian city of Palmshell with a synthetic Ebola virus, just for fun. Joachim Muller said, I didn't know that, Bjorn, but good on you, Alicia. I command you for your good deeds. Alicia White said, Thank you, Chairman Muller. It's a pleasure butchering those innocents for the glory of the Terran Council. The people of Mars are inferior to our race, and so it's an easy target for me. Bjorn Muller said, You are both horribly evil people. Even though I'm with you guys, but my only motive was to chase down that terrorist Kayla. Joachim Muller said, Thank you for your compliment, Bjorn. I didn't become the chairman of a brutal plutocratic dictatorship on our planet Earth by being a nice guy. But time is money, so you better get ready for your trip to Eden now. See you when you get back. Having said this, Joachim pressed the button to activate the trapdoors that were set under the guest seats under the table. Fortunately for Bjorn and Alicia, he had remembered to set it to non-lethal propulsion, so they propelled and landed safely on a mattress one level below. If Joachim had been forgetful and left the trapdoors on lethal killing mode, this story might have had another outcome. Chapter 3.11 Metatron delays Alicia in a way that angers Kayla. A few weeks later, Kayla was in the shower when Metatron contacted her telepathically via the divine technology mind control god chip. Metatron said, Bjorn Muller and a beast-like mutant called Alicia White are here looking for you. Shall we kill them? Kayla said, No, we cannot expose our revolutionary plans yet. Do whatever it takes to delay them while I'll take an emergency shuttle to Eden and hide. Metatron said, Okay, I'll do that. Having finished his telepathic conversation with Kayla, Mother Train approached his distinguished guests. He didn't even have time to speak before Alicia grabbed him by the bulls and hissed in his ears. Psst, where is Kayla? 
I can smell her on you. Hiss. Metatron evaluated Alicia's statement. He deduced that she was lying. He had just had a shower and he hadn't even touched Kayla afterwards. But then he looked at Alicia again and another idea struck him. How interesting it would be to have sex with the freak in front of him. After all, she was the first woman he had ever seen with yellow glowing eyes, retractable claws, and a lizard skin. And she had a sexy tight body, not an ounce of fat. But then he felt guilty. Kayla was kind of his girlfriend, and cheating on her with a mutant freak was not nice. Except it wouldn't be cheating as Kayla had given him permission to have sex with Alicia. After all, do whatever it takes to delay them. Couldn't be interpreted otherwise. Having made up his mind, Metatron grabbed Alicia by the crotch and tried to speak with a deep, sexy, drunken, whiskey drinker voice. But instead came out as squealing in pain, like a skinny little girl. As it is impossible to do so when someone is squeezing your balls while trying to be flirty. So, yikes! You like it rough, hey? They don't call me Big Jack for nothing. You and me in the storeroom over there, let's get groovy. Aha! Uh -huh. Ouch! Mmm. Alicia White's eyes sparkled brightly and she looked at Metatron with pure delight. The usual reaction she got for her rough balls grip and intense cold-blooded stare was usually fear and terror. But finally, she had found a man that liked her. They then proceeded to the storeroom and had a very rough and very loud sex. When they were done, Alicia was so happy, so she ordered Bjorn to come back with her to the spaceship. Having forgotten about their mission in the first place. For Metatron, things were actually worse. As it turned out, he wasn't up for the challenge of having sex with a super rough Alicia White. Instead, he had to drag himself to the medical bay, bleeding in severe pain from Alicia's sexual madness. And when Kayla came back, instead of thanking him for going above and beyond duty, she was full of jealousy and scolded him for cheating on her with a mutant freak. Ah, uh, life isn't fair for Metrotron. Chapter 3.12 Alicia eats some underwear, a prisoner, and almost kills Bjorn Muller during sex. A few days later, Alicia White and Bjorn Muller had arrived at a housewide black operations hideout on Mars. Bjorn, who wanted to know what was going on, decided to ask Alicia. Alicia, why are we on Mars and who is this prisoner? Alicia White said, We are on Mars because Kayla is alive and this prisoner is Kayla's ex-lover who I'm going to torture and eat alive while filming. I will then send Kayla the video recording and challenge her for a duel, which she will accept. Then I will kill her and we'll both get rewarded. Bjorn Muller said, There are so many far-fetched assumptions in that scenario, so I don't even know where to begin. How do you know Kayla is alive? The only thing you did see on Eden was Metatron. And then you went back to the ship for a nap after your shenanigans. How could you possibly know whether Kayla is alive or not? Alicia White said, Oh, because I found Kayla's panties in the storeroom when I was having rough and amazing sex with Metatron. Bjorn Moore said, 
Oh, I see. When were you going to share this piece of evidence? And why don't we bring an army to catch her? Alicia picked up Kayla's panties from her pocket, sniffed them and ate them. Then she smiled and spoke. No, I won't get help from the army. Now that I know what she smells like, I know that she will be delicious. He 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 Bjorn Muller said, Wait a second, are you planning to eat her or eat her? Alicia White said, Bit of both actually. And after killing Kayla, her boyfriend Metatron will be mine. But now I will torture and eat the prisoner. You stay in the other room, Bjorn. I know how weak your stomach is. Psst. Bjorn left the room and let Alicia do her thing with the prisoner. Between the agonizing screams of pain and gore, Bjorn felt that his jealousy was increasing by the minute. The first few weeks of the trip, Alicia had been all over him, constantly harassing him sexually with her unwanted advances. But after her crazy session with Metatron, she had lost all interest in Bjorn and kept obsessing over Metatron instead. This was so wrong. Bjorn was the sex god of the solar system, and Alicia should swoon over him so that he could reject her and boost his own ego. Bjorn made a fateful decision. He would give Alicia the sex of her life, to prove that he was a better lover than Metatron. He pumped himself up with sexual performance enhancing drugs and waited eagerly for Alicia to leave the torture chamber. A while later, she came out, soaked in blood, and Bjorn spoke to her. Alicia, forget about Metatron. The true sex god of the solar system is me, Bjorn Muller, and I can prove it to you, here and now. Alicia said, sure, bring it on, sex god. As it turned out, Bjorn was definitely not up for the challenge. What made matters worse was that Bjorn kept shouting, Nein, 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 which means no in German, which Alicia, in her frenzied and orgasmic state, interpreted it as 9 out of 10 in intensity and roughness. This was too much for old Bjorn, and combined with the effect of the boner pills, it caused him a massive heart attack. Chapter 3.13 The serial rapist and extreme misogynist Bjorn Muller embarrasses himself by accusing Alicia White of rape. Yesterday, the frail and old self-proclaimed sex god Bjorn Muller woke up from an induced coma. Apparently, the pathetic old bugger swallowed a vast amount of sexual enhancement drugs so that he could outperform the latest trister of Alicia White, the mysterious Jack Silver, also known as Metatron. This failed miserably as Bjorn got a massive heart attack during his trist with Alicia only revivable with advanced 28th century technology. Upon waking up, Bjorn alleged that he repeatedly shouted nine, which means no during the intercourse, while Alicia claims that he shouted nine out of ten of sexual intensity. While neither claim can be proven, Bear in mind that Bjorn is a filthy rapist and misogynist with a prostitute addiction, spending equivalent to the GDP of a small Martian country. While Alicia White is the young and beloved daughter of our great chairman, John White. Martin Orchard Tweak, House White News. 
Kayla turned off the news show. She didn't know whether she would be happy or indifferent that Bjorn supposedly was raped. But she was annoyed at whatever idiot that thought it would be a good idea to revive him when the Terran finally had managed to get rid of him. Suddenly, Kayla received an email from Alicia White with the text. Alicia eating Josh. Come face me if you dare. And also a video attachment with Alicia eating a Martian prisoner, Josh. This made Kayla extremely shocked, disgusted and upset. That freaking ugly mutant had already seduced Kayla's lover, Metatron, Kayla's rapist, Bjorn Muller, and now she was going after Kayla's ex, Josh. How could that crazy bitch be so obsessed with stealing her seconds? She initially thought of deleting the email, but then her curiosity got the better of her, and she opened the video attachment. As it turned out, Alicia eating Josh was not the typical homemade amateur video, and instead it was literally showing Alicia eating Josh alive. The video confused Kayla. Why was Alicia sending her a video where she was killing Kayla's ex in a gruesome way? Kayla had killed her own ex, Joshua, due to divine providence or insanity six months earlier. So why would she care if Alicia also killed her other exes? But then Kayla realized that Alicia was also the woman who was responsible for killing most people in her hometown, as well as seducing Metatron. So it was definitely time to deal with Alicia once and for all. Filled with rage, she jumped into a spaceship heading for the abandoned asteroid station where Alicia had taunted to face her. Forgetting to bring important stuff such as weapons, gear, and soldiers. Facing a homicidal mutant and her squad of black operations operatives, unarmed and alone, doesn't seem like a good plan. So how will this end? You'll find out soon. 3.14 Kayla's plot armor activates again. Some hours later, Kayla arrived at the Moreno outpost and she realized that she maybe shouldn't have traveled alone and unarmed to face a murderous mutant and her group of trained black ops killers. But should she go back to Eden and procure weapons and soldiers? Nah. She was guided by divine providence, and even if she was meant to face Alicia and her men on her own, so be it. She walked down the corridor and came to the lobby of the abandoned asteroid's old and grimy hotel. Josh's head was on a spike, and underneath it there was a sign saying, Kayla, you're next. Deciding to set things straight, Kayla dipped her finger in the blood and changed the sign to Alicia, you're next. When she was done, she heard a noise and suddenly Alicia and her men surrounded Kayla. Alicia said, Kayla, we meet at last. From smelling your panties, I knew that you'll be delicious. <laughs> Kayla said, Oof, so it was you that stole my panties? Fuck you, those were my favorite pair. Alicia said, <laughs> What are you going to do about it, little girl? Looking forward to being eaten? Kayla said, Is that eaten or eaten? Alicia White said, I would prefer to do both if you want to, but Otherwise, just eaten. I'm not peon. I might be a genocidal mutant, but I'm not a rapist. The Bjorn incident was a misunderstanding.
killer said, Okay, well, I came to kill you, not to have sex with you. So, I'll pass on Eton. Anyways, I'm here now, so let's have this fist fight to death. Alicia said, Wait, who said anything about a fist fight? Who fights with their fists in the 29th century? Killer said, Well, this is a bit awkward, but I came here on a whim to face you, and I forgot to bring any weapons. Alicia said, Okay, fist fight to death will do. Now, are you ready? Kayla said, Yes! Without saying anything, Alicia swept in and knocked Kayla to the ground with punch to the head. Ouch! What a cheater Alicia was, punching before the bell had rang. But then Kayla realized that a fight to the death on an abandoned asteroid hotel probably was not regulated, and that she was in trouble. Where was her divine connection when she needed it most? Kayla got up and Alicia swept in and punched her in the head again. Then it came to her, the divine connection and premonitions. All of a sudden, the mirage of Brahma showed up in front of her. He sighed. Oh, Kayla, Kayla, Kayla. <laughs> How do you always manage to get into trouble? Kayla said, I just follow my premonition and your divine guidance, Master. Brahma said, Did I tell you to fight a dozen armed men led by a mutant with superhuman senses on your own? Hell no, I didn't. Kayla said, I'm sorry, Grandmaster Brahma, but can you please help me out of this mess? Brahma said, No, I have been helping you out of your troubles for the last five years, but you just keep finding new ways to get into more trouble. I'm out. You're on your own. Having said that, Brahma disappeared out of Kayla's vision, and instead she stood face to face with Alicia again. Alicia White said, <gasps> Why are you talking to yourself out in the thin air? Did I punch you that hard? Kayla said, Oh, I'm just trying to convince my divine connection to save me by intervening with a miracle and kill all of you to save me. Alicia White said, And people call me crazy? Where are your gods now? Killer said, the first one I called hung up on me, but give me some time and you'll face divine wrath. Alicia said, I'll call you on that one, mostly because I'm a sadistic killer with added feline DNA, and just like a cat, I like to toy with my victims, killing them slowly for my amusement. Take this. Alicia impaled Kayla's shoulder with her sharp claws and then punched her in the face, knocking her to the ground. Alicia then licked Kayla's blood off her claws and spoke joyfully. Ah, delicious, just as I predicted. I love to sip B-plus blood type. You should be more like your blood type, sweet and courageous. Kayla said, Oh, I'll be getting the last laugh, Alicia. Hold on a minute. Kayla realized that she was now in trouble. For unclear reasons, the gods that had granted her premonitions had never granted her enough speed and strength to beat up a dozen of elite operatives in hand-to-hand -hand combat. With Brahma refusing her telepathic calls, she only had one option left to call the evil space demon Rangda. Rangda telepathically comes in and said, <laughs> Having some trouble, little girl? I'm busy, but read out the number that's visible on your hand and the code word, and you'll be fine. Killer said, Cool, I'll do that. 
Kayla looked at the number and code word on her wrist. It says 22131985. Self destruct. Kayla reads it out as 22,131,985. Self destruct. And nothing happened except for Alicia swooping in again. This time biting a piece of flesh off Kayla's damaged shoulder. Alicia White said, At least fight me like your ex Josh did. You're no fun, Kayla. Kayla said, It is spelled you are. Besides, thanks for killing Josh for me. That bastard cheated on me with my best friend. Alicia White said, so why did you come here to kill me then? Kayla said, for two reasons. One, you spread synthetic viruses on my hometown, killing most of the population. Two, I need your DNA so I can use alien technology to look like you and kill everyone on the Terran Council. Alicia White said, fair enough, but the killing me part of your plan seemed to fail miserably so far. Kayla said true. Ranga, why the fuck does the code you gave me not work? Ranga telepathically comes in and said, Oh, <laughs> sorry Kayla, I forgot to tell you. There are meant to be commas between the digits. Thus, read them out as single digits. Kayla said, okay, cool. Two, Two, one, three, one, nine, eight, five. Self destruct. Having spoken out the sequence, the battle armors of Alicia White and her operatives all self destructed, killing the entire group. Boom! Kayla looked around herself in disbelief and joy. How had Ranga managed to implant a bomb in the battle armors of Kayla's enemy in record time from her location through another dimension? It was truly a miracle. Kayla said, Thanks Ranga, you are now my new interdimensional best friend forever. Ranga said, Good! <laughs> Then you wouldn't mind if I accidentally kill your mentor, Brahma, would you? Kayla said, Nah, he left me to die. Fuck him. Rangda said, Good, I'll talk to you later. Understandably, the reader now wants to know how Rangda could rig Alicia and her group's battle armors with explosives for self-destruction. Obviously, she didn't. Instead, it was Alicia's father, John White, the chairman of House White, i.e. the dictator North America, who was the culprit or hero behind it. John, being evil enough to imbue his daughter with predator DNA to make her more fearsome, was also ruthless enough to predict that she would double-cross him in the future. And like any villain with self-respect, he had a contingency plan. A voice-activated self-destruct sequence in her daughter's and her operative's battle armors. But how could Renda know the activation sequence to the self-destruction mechanism? Simple. She was a supernatural space demon with super 